Good morning. Uh, hello. Welcome to the Ideas and Imagination stream, part of the Watts 2020 online. Um, we are so excited to get started with our first panel. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Watts Toronto operates on land that is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Paytoon First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. The territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabeg and Allied Nations to care for and share the resources around peoples, uh, the Great Lakes in peace. Uh, sorry, um, Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. We are privileged to live, work and create in this territory and strive to act with awareness and solidarity. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land that you occupy, wherever you're tuning in from. You can find this out at nativeland, native-land.ca. The link uh, will be dropped in the YouTube comments for you to see. Um, this is the first panel today of the Ideas and Imagination stream. Um, this is The Future Is Now. Um, I would like to welcome our uh, panelists right here. Hi. Hi. Hello, good morning. Good uh, morning. So Nina Lauren studied creative writing at Concordia University in Montreal, where she currently lives. She speaks and reads in Russian, French, and English, but write, writes her novels in English. She wrote her first novel while getting her writing degree, and Girl Last Seen was a bestseller uh, a year later in 2017. Caroline Georges is the author of seven books, including Under the Stone, a uh, finalist for the 2012 Quebec Booksellers Prize. Her latest novel, The Imago Stage, has won several honors in French, including the Governor General's Literary Award in 2018. Uh, Caroline currently lives in Montreal. And finally, uh, S.D. Krostoka, is a professor of humanities and social and political thought at York University uh, in Toronto. She's the author of Permission, a novel, and Matches, a light book, and the co-editor of uh, Political Uses of Utopia, New Marxist, Anarchist, and Radical Democrat Democratic Perspectives. She currently lives in Toronto. Um, so now we will be doing some readings. Um, Nina, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Um, well, let me first introduce my book. It's Absolutely. A Woman Alone. It's uh, the story of a woman who moves into a really high-tech smart home in this experimental sort of smart city. And she starts to suspect that someone else lived in the house before her and that the house killed them. So um, I'm going to read from uh, chapter three, where you can see a bit of... Uh, of the house and what's going on. So I'll just jump right into it. I run my fingertip over the thin skin of my outer wrist, right below the wrist bone. You can't tell there's no scar and not even a mark, but this is where the microchip is embedded. A microchip that, according to the brochure, thousands of sensors all over the house will detect and react to your unique DNA signature. I don't see why they couldn't have gone with facial recognition or any similar technology instead, but according to Clarice, the DNA signature offers superior possibilities. The chip is powered by my own body heat and apart from identifying me flawlessly to every feature in the smart home, it also takes my vital signs and will activate a call for help if it picks up on any distress. Not wasting a single second to get you the help you need, the brochure read. Think of what it, what it will mean for our daughter, Scott said. No more panic in the middle of the night because of a rash or a fever. The chip knows best when the situation is urgent and makes a decision for us. He presented it as a good thing. But I couldn't stand the idea of microchipping my child, sticking that needle into the perfect creamy skin of her chubby arm. It feels wrong. It feels like despoiling her, taking away her integrity somehow. So yeah, here, uh, oh, hi. Sorry, thank you for reading. Um, and then Caroline, would you like to read next? Yeah, sure. So thank you. here's my book. It's uh, The Mago Stage. 
It's uh, we are in the near future. The narrator had a very traumatic childhood. Uh, the only thing she loves is images and uh, fiction, uh, and so she be she become. Uh, she becomes a model, a successful one, and she makes some money. Then she retires pretty soon, and she creates a three D. She creates a three D avatar online to to create images of herself. And, and then uh, I'm gonna go uh, right into the metaverse. Um, okay, then it comes the urgent need to dive back into the digital ether to cross over beyond matter as far as I can go. So I connect to the Kawaii circuit. Of all the virtual worlds I spend time in, it's the most colorful. Thousands of avatars gather there day and night, creating a massive city of festive displays. Everyone receiving surprise packs filled with hearts, affectionate thoughts, and funny costumes to wear to join in on the show. That night, I receive a dragonfly skin with a shimmering comet's tail. In the large ante room, hundreds of dragonflies are flitting around each other. Some of them emit short melodies, others buzz. The animation that comes with my skin generates a rhythmic phrase with high-pitched percussion. Every newcomer adds to the performance, and everyone is greeted with wide smiles. The stats graphic shows that a dozen avatars from China have just joined us, and then two from Brazil, then three others from Norway. And on it goes, every minute, new dragonflies from around the world join the gathering. Friend requests appears by the dozen in a pink square with royal gilding. I accept them all, though I will never communicate with any of my new contacts. It's the thought that counts. We come here to melt into the fray. We send invitations, kisses, and compliments. It's unconditional, virtual, free love. I make my way through the rooms with pink dolls who are sitting on giant candies with pastel plush toys, surrounded by twinkle of light and emoticons in the shape of smiling stars. I carefully study dresses made of animated lace, which run short stories of best friends forever in a loop. The walls change color and distort to let in massive keyholes that glide through space, offering a glimpse of fragments of images of shotacons and lolicons, where children caress each other suggestively. In trying to change rooms, I click, by mistake, on one of the locks that arrived at my height, and I am immediately teleported into an orgy in an anti scene. So I will stop there because, and I would, I would like to have it. It's been translated by Rhonda Mullins. That's really beautiful. Yeah, thank you for reading. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now I'm going to invite uh, SD to read. Uh, thanks. So my my book, uh, The Eyelid, came out um, earlier this year with Coach House in Toronto, and it's it's a story about a Parisian loser. Um, so it's set in Paris, which is the capital of a world state known as Greater America. It is also in the near future, um, and this. Uh, man uh, an, un, of unspecified age and unnamed um, meets another who invites him to a kind of um, virtual world except not because it is a world that is actually in the minds and not a virtual world in the way that Mina and Caroline uh, describe it. And, um, and it is a bit retro, even though it is set in the near future, um, because progress has slowed down. So I'll, I'll read uh, for roughly the same length of time from, from the beginning. Come autumn, the eyes reap color against the lengthening shadows and the night that seals them closed. As if nature, having already given spring to love, and summer to leisure made a season especially for dreamers. 
its days hazy and heavy-lidded, its evenings haloed and smudged by rain, the hours hypnotic passage, sleeping all who, dazed and doubled in themselves, fall leaf-like under its spell. Men we take to be awake seem not quite so, presentable, bright-eyed, facing the day, possibly in the habit of retiring, already groomed for their appointment with tomorrow, they come upon us in our fog of somnolence and, reminded of rest, let their head sink back into the sky's great pillow, forgetting their progress. As for those with nowhere to go, or in no particular rush, they seem to have only just climbed out of bed, their clothes creased, as if yesterday's circadian sign had them give up their undressing, and the crack of dawn took away the reason to go on. Drowsy, practically dozing on their feet, they let their lids droop low enough to screen their dreams, with half an eye still on the noir of reality. In autumn, such absences and bifocal vision come naturally, spreading like an insuppressible yawn. I no longer remember the day we met, unemployed for going on a year, pondering a future set agape by idleness. I had slipped by degrees into a not unpleasant state of semi-consciousness, leaving time to erode in peace what little remained of my savings. As my thoughts hewed ever closer to my surroundings, cocooned in ambient noise and newsprint, I rustled through the daily papers and, nursing a tall glass, looked out at the street, teeming behind the window pane. Childless and sans disciple, I had a corner of tedium to myself, but no life, no occupation, and no prospects to speak of, save for a standing invitation from a retired bookbinder and a psychoanalyst, an elderly couple, to visit their country estate. So that's that's all I think I'm oh. going to read. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm also now going to uh, introduce uh, our host. Um, great. Um, Hello. Okay. So, good morning. Um, Jamie Chomachuk is an award-winning writer and illustrator whose work has appeared in film, television, books comics, and graphic novels. His work ranges from the heartwarming to the blood curdling with graphic novels like Will I See and the forthcoming Area City and Good Boys. He is the host of the Super Pulp Science Podcast. So welcome. Hello, and thank you for uh, having me. Sorry for my tardiness. Um, I was um, in the midst of the uh, conundrum of getting my internet back up. And then I realized that all four of us write books where a little bit of technology gets right in the way of everything you planned. And then I thought, okay, I guess that's just how it's supposed to be today. Um, and then I was entered into the waiting room and I got to listen to these nuanced, incredible uh, stories in your own voices. And I think that really, maybe it was technology's way of reminding us that um, your words are the important part of all of the shenanigans going on, and not maybe some tardy host or maybe a weak internet connection. So thank you for uh, jumping into the breach there, all three of you. Um, the first thing I would love to ask, um, this is an open question to all of you. Uh, technology creates sometimes for us the impossible. And the act of writing a novel sometimes can also seem impossible. And I'm wondering if you could tell me what is it about the impossible that drives you as either your process or uh, the plot of your novel? We can go in order of how you're stacked on my screen. If you want SD, you could lead with us. <laughs> Uh, what drives us to pursue the um, pursue the impossible? Uh, yeah, the answer would be it's possibility. Mm. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess for me it would be that 
you know, so many things we take to be impossible are possible. And technology does remind us of that, even if it is in a very abbreviated form or in a very virtual form. Um, it reminds us collectively of that, but our imagination reminds us of that individually. Uh, I, I'd had, yeah, I just want to say, I, I don't understand the impossible concept because, uh, I don't know, I have some imagination, so everything's possible. Uh, I could not uh, live with uh, that uh, certitude. And I want to add, it's my first ever live English event, so I might look a little bit uh, scared, and I am, okay? <laughs> so so pardon my, my bad English. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, so impossible, I don't know. I, it's kind of uh, anxious for me to think about that uh, because, um, I don't know, I live in, in an infinite process of creating ideas and new possible and, and cr creating with new tools and exploring. And I don't know, uh, maybe I didn't just um, uh, encounter some impossible uh, possible. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, I can talk about actually the process, not not just the process of writing, but the whole process of becoming an author. And I mean, we know that it's super hard to break through in 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 writing and publishing and in general in the whole domain. So, uh, well, at one point I was uh, after my first book came out, I was at this event in New York. And I ran into, uh, of all people, my, one of my creative writing instructors from Concordia. And it was such a huge surprise. Like he was so shocked to see me and I was really surprised to see him. And then he took me aside and said, wow, you published a book with Grand Central. That's a huge accomplishment. And I kind of got the vibe like, oh, wow, you won the lottery. <laughs> and like, I guess the odds were about the same of me, like ever, like, you know, a little girl who like, was born in Russia and becoming a, a, an author published in New York, I had like roughly the same odds as winning the 649. So, and maybe I just, and I realized just like a few weeks ago, you know how being on sub is like said to be the worst part of being a writer, like your agent sends your book out and you're just die of anxiety while the rejections roll in. And I like, it occurred to me that like I love my publisher, but I kind of miss the thrill of being on sub. So I guess I just like the challenge of achieving impossible things. Do any of you uh, have a moment when you're working on a manuscript where you decide, okay, not this one and put it aside? Should we respond in? Have you ever gotten? Uh, whoever speaks first, I like a uh, bear pit. Um, hmm. Whoever growls um, first. Well, I have many, many, many books that I've been written for uh, for a decade. So I think everything is stuck uh, inside of me. And when they feel like pushing, they push, and uh, I answer, and uh, I just write them. And and if the process is not complete, well, it's incomplete, and maybe I'll die with. 20 books uh, on my on my in my head and it's okay so um, uh, I'm kind of intuitive uh, with my creative process and uh, I really uh, I'm not in control there so I wait for it to to build up and when I hear a voice a clear voice when I feel a scene when I feel a, a world then I, I, I just uh, um, uh, dive in it. I just dive in it and I, I explore it and I explore it uh, as much as I can. And when I feel that a form, a structure uh, is, 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 I see the form and I see it come alive, then I, 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 then I, I, I push and I push until I've, I feel it's, it's there. But, um, uh, I know that I will. I have a book in mind. I won't write it before twenty years, so it's okay. I, I I don't mind. I have many many projects at the same time, and they are they are living their own life, if I may say. I have to say that I am uh, interminably jealous of your calm about all the books that may just live in you and pass yeah. on to you. 
<laughs> I do not have that sense of calm when I'm writing. I'm constantly uh, anxious about the next thing. Uh, what about the two of you? Do you find uh, the next project elusive, or the current? Do you work on lots of things at the same time, or do you? Uh, go ahead, Nina. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like raising my hand. I'm more used to be like you know called on like in school. Yes, you. Okay. So uh, well, I I completely agree with Caroline. It's it's not every book is going to be published or even some that will be published won't be successful some won't even make it to ever uh, publication being on sub being acquired and that's okay like not everything you don't have to hit it out of the ballpark every single time or sometimes you do but the time is wrong there's lots of reasons i've kind of really learned to be cool with it so now i look at books that don't go anywhere as uh, learning kind of opportunities mm -hmm. But sometimes you just know, you, you just want to pursue an idea anyway, even though you know it's super not commercial. And that too, it's like, that's what makes writing fun. And you have to keep in touch with that side of it that was fun because at some point you were writing before you were ever published. You had no agent, no nobody. You, you never knew anyone would ever read it. You still went to your computer every day and you wrote. And I think it's important to keep in touch with that drive, what made you write when you had absolutely nothing in it. Well, I don't have much to add really because uh, it is as you describe it, but I don't I don't think I I have an intuitive sense of what works. It, it's something that, you know, an idea I might have and I can explore it and I think one day it's good and another I realize it's actually um it's actually uh, not something that I can get excited about for a long stretch of time, but I, I lose perspective uh, sometimes. And even last night as, as I was going to sleep, I thought I had a, an idea for a short story and it was, uh, it, was, it was a kind of grotesque short story, but in the end I realized as grotesque as it is and as funny as it would be, I probably won't ever write it but I don't work on many things at the same time. I'm a rather less pro prolific writer than, than um, everyone here. We all just do it one word at a time. I don't think you have anything to apologize for there. Um, okay, so in, I'm gonna just do a little roundabout uh, touching on all of your work. In The Girl, uh, well, in A Woman Alone, there is an aspect of technology as sort of both um, dwelling, guardian, and also a sinister element to it there. Uh, in the eyelid, we have this technology connected to dreaming and the, and the sort of moratorium placed on that dreaming. Uh, and in Imago stage, we have uh, a virtual world, which is in a way um, the dream of technology. It's that these two ideas sort of housed together. It's both a dwelling and a dream and a piece of technology. Um, what is it that led any of you to these specific elements in your story? Um, um, uh, I won't go. Uh, I'm also an artist and a, a, a photographer for I've been for many decades. And I was exploring, um, I was fascinated um, by our quest to define the idol feminine feminine image uh, and I started to play with an avatar to create images a lot of images thousands of images with my avatar and uh, playing with an avatar is playing with a lot of people because you need a lot of parts of avatar to be everybody's creating a part of the avatar airs uh, skin uh, eyes, uh, um, clothing, uh, everything, you know. So uh, uh, I had a, a, a photographic process, artistic process with an avatar uh, before I start r uh, writing my book. And I was wondering how we define beauty, how do we create it, how pop culture, fiction, fashion and art history define our vision of femininity. And while uh, working on this quest, my mother uh, started to be sick. Um, very, very sick, cancer sick. So part of my life was exploring the rising of the digital body while I was seeing my mother uh, losing her own health. And uh, she was disappearing right in front of me. And this was a very 
painful and strange experience, the rising of the digital body and the decay of the physical one. And that became the core of my novel. So I wanted to explore how we, how we get some freedom in the digital world, how we create our, our, our new selves, our new images of ourselves in digital bodies while we are uh, still uh, not controlling our own uh, biological body. So that was the, the idea, the, the, um, the first questions I had. Can I go next? Absolutely. Um, my, so my book has also um, got its start, starting point in a disappearance um, it was the death of a friend, and um, he was an elderly person already. Um, I didn't know him terribly well, um, but I thought that this uh, book could be a kind of homage to him and a kind of recreation in the imagination of what he might have been like, including some of the dreams that he had, uh, that is to say the the dreams of utopia, revolution, uh, changing the world for the better. Um, he was a sort of a radical thinker, uh, I might say, although not a terrifically public figure. And, um, and it's really the imagination and not uh, technology, virtual reality, that, um, that I placed my hopes in, uh, in the imagine, imagining process. Uh, and in fact, because he was of a certain age, um, born in 1939, uh, uh, he was not really uh, very techie. Uh, so I thought that would be the way to, uh, to do this homage. Nina? Well, um... I guess it's not a spoiler to say that in my book, technology is not the good guy. So, but really what inspired it, it was something very small. I once needed something at Best Buy and I just took a walk through the Best Buy and a lot of the stuff in my book, it either exists already or probably will in five years. So, and I was just kind of complaining inside my head, how am I gonna write crime fiction then? I mean, how do you get away with murder when there's like cameras on you all the time? and. Uh, like facial recognition everywhere. And so I like kind of, hmm, from there on the, the idea kind of took off and I had no no plot when I started writing it, it kind of came to me. So yeah, it's really just kind of a, don't want to say cautionary tale, but kind of a playing out of a worst case scenario, technologically speaking. Um, it's been said by smarter people than me that a tool is just a weapon if you hold it right. Um, and I find one thing really interesting about all of your work is the way in which these technologies, these new things, you just roll over and you can see the very beneficial application to all of the ideas. Like, in a way, I'd like to live in the world of, in the good version of all of the worlds that you guys have created. But what I'm, I'm more interested uh, than in sort of the plot device of technology, and I think many of your readers continue to show up for the same reason, is how do you find the humanity in your own words? What is the process that you use to bring life to your characters? I can start, I guess. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I write a lot of unlikable people. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told and I know it and I do it on purpose because it's just that's something to really grab onto. Because likability can be like, you know, all happy families are alike and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. Works for people too. And once you know what their thing is that makes them tick, then you can really start to build a character and it gets interesting from there. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating to explore their character. Hmm. Um, so for me, humanity is basically, I think in this book, um, about thinking uh, about more than just oneself and one's self-fulfillment or one's immediate gratification. Um, it's about uh, a certain, uh, maintaining a certain promise in the mind that is universal, about universal human happiness being somehow attainable. So it's, it's a hope. And that um, that is central to this book. Um, and technology stands in the way. And I, I guess 
I, I don't want to say too much about it, but as you as you say, technology is is uh, is more or less the bad guy. Um, um, at the same time, it uh, mirrors um, how we daydream. That is to say, it mirrors a natural process. So it is. Um, it would seem to be rather inoffensive, but it is at the service of capital and state in the sense that it, um, it is there to help us to free time from work to be able to, um, to monetize um, every minute of our lives or as much as possible. If technology uh, serves us to do that, then of course it's a tool in the hands of, of, the, of the ruling um, class, if you like. Well, my narrator uh, was born in front of the TV, and that's the that's the start of uh, of our journey. And 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 she 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 stayed in front of the TV because she had no family familial fam familial life. She, it was very uh, she had a very traumatic childhood, and uh, she was uh, her father was really aggressive and uh, alcoholic and. Her mother was very, very sad, uh, losing a lot of child, and 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 so the humanity in my character is that she didn't find humanity in her in her uh, surrounding, and she uh, tried to find it in TV, in in fiction, in in in, in images. She's trying to 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 find the purpose of life uh, through fiction and through images and. Uh, further in the book, uh, her mother gets sick and she gets to, to, to renew with her family, but she was decayed, self-confined, like an ikikomori, you know, the concept of ikikomori. She's self-confined in a room and she, she doesn't go out. She doesn't have any relationship, but she has to, to, to find a way to, um, to 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 get a connection with her mother and her father, and, and she she does it in a, in a very weird way. I won't tell much about it, but uh, but I think humanity in my book is about f a quest of it <laughs> through friction. So she she really tries to figure out humanity and how to be humane, but in uh, in her love of fiction and images so well i think it's it's sum it up well done um so we have unlikable characters from nina we have a uh, quest for truth it feels like uh from sd and we have the complicated uh double-edged sword that is love uh from caroline um is there something that you as authors, and I think this is for people who are watching that are also authors and wondering about that, um, that fear of submitting and not getting it right, and that's only what people will see. Would you be willing to share with us something that you find difficult to write well from your perspective? And, and um, I'll go first so that it's just not me asking you to show <laughs> your, uh, your parts. Um, when I'm writing, I find myself, I get trapped in the what I call the tunnel of plot. And I just keep trying to pile things that will bring us somewhere else. And I have to remind myself that people read books and people's hearts have to connect to these characters. And I have to go back and tell myself, okay, now you have to reread this as a human being, not, not as a storyteller. Um, and that is the part that I find the hardest to do. Is there a thing that you find difficult to do as a writer? You can go first, I guess. Um, <laughs> no one wants to go first. I went first already. <laughs> yes, that's right. You went first, but you're the master of ceremonies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I would say that I find it very hard to write beyond the, the dialogue exchange. Uh, there's something that in, inevitably leads me to this uh, situation, an exchange between two people. And, um, and sometimes the plot gets 
lost. And uh, so I like to challenge myself. And I think if I continue to write, it would be uh, focusing more on plot and less trying to move away from from an exchange between two individuals. Um, Maybe we should exchange it, notes. You're good at everything I'm bad at. <laughs> Nina, what do you think? What deep, dark secret about your own writing are you hiding in your notebook? Well, um, I wanted to like take the easy way out and say, oh, I hate writing action sequences. And I do hate writing action sequences. I'm really bad at it. I need to fi figure it out, like choreograph it in my head. But I think what I really, really struggle with is writing characters that people with co will connect with. Again, likability comes up. And I don't just mean likable, but relatable. I find it really difficult sometimes because I already have my vision and I don't necessarily think of the readers when I create a character. And after I'm like all like jazzed about writing this book, it's too late to drastically change the character to make him more appealing like to a wider like audience of people. And that I sometimes, uh, I, I get feedback, oh my God, the character was so detestable and I didn't even write her to be detestable, you know? She just happened. So that I struggle with a little bit. Nina, it sounds uh, like you sharpen that into, a, uh, into an advantage though. Well, yeah, you gotta play yeah. to your strengths. Well, uh, Honestly, Caroline, I didn't I, mean to cut you off. No, no, it's okay. It's I just um, I really don't think about the reader when I write. Never. It's been thirty years, and I never. I think about the book. I think about the text that's there. It it wants to appear, and uh, I will make it appear. That that's that's my job. I struggle with this right now, talking about how I work. It for me because it's so intuitive. It's so you know, it's it's organic. I don't know how to say that. I, I have an idea. I, 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 as I said, I'm I was born in front of the TV. I read books since I, I know how to read. And for me, fiction is just an, a natural process. So I have to be uh, to have some discipline and to 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 sit down and to 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 write it. Okay, but the, the, the hardest part for me is to try to, to explain what I'm doing, to try to, to find a purpose and, and, and to be all intellectual about it and, and try to, to make some, some sense out of it. Because for me, it's, it's, I'm, I, in French, we say angle mort. I don't know in English how we say that. You know, I'm in the dead zone of my book. It's like, uh, how do you say that? Angle mort? Anybody <laughs> knows how to say that? And then, like yeah. in driving the the part that you can see yeah the, the part is uh, oh boy the blind spot, blind spot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay so i'm always in the blind spot of my writing and 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 so when, when people ask me how do you do this and why this and why that i don't know i i will i will create an answer for you sure but uh, it will be a creation okay i will try to 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 figure out a way to answer but it, it will be creation because i really don't know i'm i'm really in an intuitive process of creation for me is purely organic there's nothing intellectual sorry <laughs> Yeah. No, there's nothing to apologize for. Yeah. What I'm often fascinated by, um, I interview a lot of writers, uh, everybody comes at it from a completely different place. I have yet to find anybody who says an answer that matches anybody else that I have ever okay. found. <laughs> so I don't think you have any, any um, uh, just stick with that intuition as your answer and explore that. If people ask, just tell, um, I think, everyone can agree we all love a mystery and of intuition course. is a great mystery when it comes to writing so the most <laughs> yeah. hard that right um i have in even this last um uh, say 20 minutes feel like i've learned more about um different ways to write character and story than maybe i did in my last two novels so one of the things I would like to ask you now, it's nice to be in a room full of people who are smaller than, are smarter than you, even if, uh, even if you're very far away. Um, what is advice you would give to somebody who is about to give up? 
you, you can do anything more than creating. That's the ultimate thing a human being can do. Don't stop, ever. Create. That's what we can do. <laughs> we have to create. It's, it, it's a way of being. It's a way of going further. It's a way to understand our world, even if it's only uh, emotional uh, comprehension. So, no, do. Create. That's how we live. Yeah. I agree with that completely. And I wanted to add from a technical standpoint, yes, when I was younger, I regarded each manuscript that I started as this like jumping off point, oh, I'll finish it. And then like, I'll get this book deal and then I'll be this rock star. And then I realized you just have to see the book itself as the end goal. The, 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 the book itself is why you're doing this, not for what happens after. Only then you will have a book that's worth creating. So like just to regard, don't forget about all of the, the other stuff, just do it for the sake of the book. My advice would be wait. Um, and sometimes I think we underestimate waiting and doing something else. And if, um, if it happens that we will really give up, well, then maybe that there was a reason for that and we can't just grasp it um, in any rational, uh, self-analyzing way. But I think, I think waiting uh, for a project to mature is very important. And, um, and that sometimes means abandoning it, at least consciously. Um, it then comes back as or sometimes to haunt you. And maybe those are the best projects. At least I've found that those are the best projects. That Same here. Yeah. Come back when you least expect them and give you hope in a sense that there's something in you that thinks when you don't think. Um, to remember that uh, publishing is the byproduct of byproduct of writing, but not the point of writing, I think is an important step. Um, all of you, we have reached the end of our time. I would like to thank you so much um, for putting up with my questions and for sharing some of your wisdom and your talent with us. Um, I would like to remind our viewers that all of their books are available through links in the store here on the website and at uh, Back of Phoenix Books. You can also check out a link there. We are going to be... Uh, uh, segueing into a new segment here and i believe that uh, vanessa is going to take over thank you so much thank you thank you thank you all thank you hello um so that was our first panel this morning on this stream which is very exciting um i would like to introduce Paul. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Vanessa. So uh, Paul will be doing a five minute reading for us, which is really exciting. Um, Paul Bermich is a Toronto based poet, multimedia artist, creative writing professor and literary editor. He is the author of several poetry collections, including the Trillium Award nominated The Reinvention of the Human Hand. He teaches at Sheridan College and is the founding editor of Book Writer Books, an imprint of Wall Second Wind Publishers Limited. Take it away. Thank you, Vanessa. And uh, thank you to everyone who's tuning in to Toronto Word on the Streets. Uh, this, is a, this is a fascinating way of interacting. And I'm happy to be here to read from my new book, Shared Universe, for you. And I'm going to start with the title poem, uh, which is a bit of a, a fable, a nonsense fable. And we'll start there. This is Shared Universe. You, you and the ice cream truck and the king cobra all exist in the same universe as the two-legged tortoise, the star queen nebula, and me. Eventually, there must be a story that involves all six of us. You will be driving the ice cream truck among the farthest stars in search of his majesty, King Cobra. Despite his famous venom, despite his propensity to strike, and I will follow behind you riding the wounded tortoise, the front wheels of a plastic batmobile glued to her shell as prostheses. These are the forms we will take when we encounter the star queen in her home, the pillars of creation billowing from her head. 
And there is King Cobra coiling his long body around the pillars, emanating from her third eye as Uraeus from the forehead of a pharaoh. You have come here, he says, to learn what you already know, that you exist in the same universe as ice cream, batmobiles, and the act of mutilation. New stars are fusing within the pillars, and within the stars, newborn elements, hydrogen, beryllium, carbon, iron. Use these to make an apple, the serpent says, or make it out of gold, it's all the same. And now a blind donkey arrives behind us, and a silvery porpoise, and an immense hypothetical mountain, and we all nod knowingly, knowing what we know. And I will leave you with one other short poem before I, uh, I leave you to the next panel. And this is from a section of my book called Essential Apparatus for the Imaginary World. And uh, these poems take the form of sort of blueprints for imaginary machines. And this machine uh, is the patent for economic equality engine. So hopefully we can get this built. One hydraulic powered guillotine emerges from each of 12 sides of a 13 sided polyhedron cast in mirror finished platinum. In the center of the 13th side, an aperture that opens and closes via one black enamel iris allows for the release of fluids. The vertical struts of the guillotines are fashioned like gold vertebrae. The blades themselves are shaped like a moth wing, a laurel wreath, a scythe, a subpoena, a kite feather, a marlin fin, a paper fan, a scapula, a Bible, a crescent moon, a rejection letter, and a cobra's tongue, respectively. It can be programmed to snap its blades shut in sequence, producing melodies. It can be programmed to play Gassenhauer, for example. It can be taught to walk on the tips of its spines like a sea urchin ejecting streams of red fluid from its gleaming black aperture in self-defense. And, uh, and one small thing before I leave you, the last thing in the book is uh, a nursery rhyme called Hush. And uh, I, I always like to end a reading with this. Hush, little planet, nothing to fear. Papa's going to buy you an atmosphere. And if that atmosphere has costs, Papa's going to buy you a holocaust. And if... Thank you very much. Thank you so much for reading, Paul. That was great. Um, I hope you uh, tune to the rest of the festival and I'm really excited for your collection. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be part of Word on the Street again this year. Thank you, Vanessa. And uh, I hope the rest of the uh, festival goes smoothly on your YouTube channels. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Uh, so you can find Paul's book, uh, The Shared Universe, at Another Story Bookshop on our digital marketplace at thewordonthestreet.com uh, slash shop. Um, should be able to throw that up on the screen. Um, but uh, our shop is online. Our digital marketplace is uh, ready for you to peruse it. Um, the books of the Futures Now panelists uh, before uh, the segment um, are available at bacaphoenixbooks.com, so you can order directly through them. Uh, we'll be back in about 20 minutes for a conversation with uh, Wabusheg Rice and Kevin Chong at 11.15.
Hello, and welcome back to Ideas and Imagination. Um, we are starting our next panel now. Um, so our next host is author of the best-selling Moon of the Crusted Snow. Uh, please welcome Wabijig Rice, an author and journalist originally from Wasaking First Nation. His first short story collection, Midnight Sweat Lodge, won an Independent Publishers Book Award in 2012. His debut novel, Legacy, followed in 2014. He now splits his time between Sudbury and Wasaking. Hi, everybody. Good, good morning uh, or uh, good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. That's the beauty of our uh, online gatherings these days. Uh, just big thanks to Word on the Street Toronto for inviting me to be a part of this uh, great event. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here with Kevin uh, today to chat about the plague. And uh, I hope you all are doing fine wherever you're uh, joining us from and uh, getting used to these uh, online uh, gatherings that we're having these days. And I hope, of course, that you're all staying uh, safe and healthy. So uh, it is my great honor uh, to introduce Kevin Chong. He's the author of six books, including most recently the 2018 novel, The Plague. He lives in Vancouver, but has recently begun teaching creative writing at UBCO in Kelowna. So what's gonna happen today is uh, Kevin will offer us a reading from The Plague and he and I will have a chat. Before I uh, bring in uh, Kevin, I uh, just want to remind you that you can shop today's book list with uh, Back of Phoenix book Bookstore. You can visit backofphoenixbooks.com or find the link in the live YouTube comment scroll. And don't forget to check out our digital marketplace. You can access it through the WOTS Toronto website or Watch Toronto or at the link dropped in the YouTube live comment scroll. So, Kevin, welcome. How are you doing today? Oh, good. I just had to roll out of bed and... Uh... 15 minutes ago and fed my daughter some grapes and ran upstairs to my office, my messy office. And now I'm here. It's uh, it's kind of good to be like doing stuff online. I did a reading 12 hours ago in Vancouver. So it's, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm barnstorming the country. It's neat. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I guess that's the one uh, bonus of these online events is, you know, we only have to really brush our hair and put on a shirt uh, about five minutes before uh, broadcast time. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty uh, convenient in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Missing people, but yeah. yeah. Well, I'm I'm stoked to talk to you about the plague. But first, uh, would you mind offering us the uh, our viewers a little glimpse of it? Yeah, yeah. This is a story that takes off uh, the Albert Camus novel uh, by the same name, and uh, in my version, uh, Vancouver instead of uh, Oran and uh, North Algeria or Algeria is. Uh, uh, quarantined uh, after an infectious disease hits the city. And uh, the scene I'm going to read from takes place near the beginning of the novel, in which uh, the city is just closing its uh, borders and flights are being uh, canceled. And the one character who is a, a journalist who lives in the suburbs has to get back home, otherwise he's going to be trapped. Uh, so I'm just going to read a couple pages. What is it, Sudu asked, he asked. He added, I can keep a secret. Hornbo hesitated. The World Health Organization, in dialogue with Vancouver Coastal Health, had recommended a citywide quarantine. The announcement would come quickly and leave people the least amount of time to flee. The city wanted to avoid the situation that had occurred in Surat, India in 1994, when the disease struck and 300,000 people evacuated the city in fear of being quarantined. Flights coming into the city were being rerouted, Roadblocks would be erected on all highways and bridges to the metro area within an hour. You live in the boonies, don't you? I figured you should get a head start, he said, reaching for a wallet that was stuffed with $100 bills. Sidhu began to run toward the nearest SkyTrain station. He was not physically fit, so he found himself staggering at the foot of Water Street. The city scene outside, give or take a few face masks, could have passed for any day in the past decade. The sun beat down benevolently, and the air was worth paying money to breathe. He swiped his compass card as he rushed through the SkyTrain gates, then ran down the steps to catch the incoming train. He was huffing and puffing when he took his seat. The crowd in the half-full SkyTrain's car was occupied by commuters who were bored, jovial, solitary. There was a couple in their 20s making out an extremely tall cyclist in spandex with his racing bike, one guy singing a line of music with his eyes closed. He recognized a face or two, people he didn't know, but who, like him, rode this train until its terminal point in Surrey. They had fit themselves snugly into the compartments of personal space, pressed against window seats, their bodies and briefcases and purses on their laps, 
He checked his phone for news coverage as the car slowed into Barrard Station. Nothing. He texted his wife to say that he was coming home. She texted back to ask him to buy string cheese. He checked his phone again. Nothing on his paper's app or website. It occurred to him that his this had been a prank, and he was rushing home based on misinformation. So he told himself that this could not happen. At Stadium Chinatown Station, a two-sentence item appeared on Honbo's website. When they stepped uh, stopped outside Science World, he received two calls from his paper's editor-in-chief. He left them unanswered, and the voice bells unopened. On social media, there were unofficial reports about roadblocks and the airport closure. By the time they reached Commercial Broadway Station, the SkyTrain had started to fill. Sidhu gave up his seat to a pregnant woman. People pushed into the car, their faces red from running and squeezing. Heads remained bowed toward their devices, and thumbs tapped screens for fresh web browsers. People whispered to one another, looking out from the corners of their eyes. At the Joyce Collingwood Station, the last one before they crossed city limits, Sidhu had a sense of what it might be like to commute in to- Tokyo or Shanghai. Many passengers who stood could no longer hold onto a strap or rail or pole. They propped themselves against other uh, commuters desperate to get home. They still held phones up to their faces. Sometimes pressed to their cheeks, they tapped and tapped. When the train left the station, the suburban knights in the car heaved one collective sigh. When the automated voice, heralded by the ubiquitous three-tone chime, announced the next stop to be Metro Town, Sidhu heard cheers. The city limits came within sight as their train began to slow down. Sidhu waited for it to halt, but he still felt surprised. Groans flushed out the sighs. The mood spoiled. Sidhu heard someone complain. They had trouble breathing. Five minutes passed. They began to move again. Those who were standing wilted as the car inched in the opposite direction. Everyone was quiet. They were going back into the city, back toward death. Sidhu expected an announcement over the PA system, but all they heard was the chime followed by the pre-recorded voice announcing the next stop, Joyce Collingwood Station. The train thinned out more or less in the same order with people returning to their offices and workplaces. Sidhu got off behind the man in spandex rolling his bike. He wanted to completely reverse his course and go back into uh, his stool at the gastro pub. He sent Uma a terse uh, text message and called his boss to say he was returning to the office. Night swallowed the skyline and the city became busier. All around were people who looked like Sidhu, stunned, moving uneasily, moving because they would look crazy if they just stood there. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad you began with that passage because I remember as I was reading it, that was one of the moments where I sort of uh, became a little bit anxious, I guess. You know, it just sort (laughs) of reminded me about, uh, you know, some of the earlier tense times that we've gone through uh, with with our current pandemic, but also just, you know, that, that panic that can arise. So... Uh, following this, Sidhu ends up uh, locked down in a hotel in, in downtown Vancouver for a couple months. Um, so as mentioned, you know, like it's, you know, hard not to draw parallels to our current situation. So yeah. what's it like for you now to discuss your book about a plague during a global pandemic? I could ask you the same question, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, it's it's nice to have a second burst of attention for a book that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it is interesting, you know. I, I kind of cringe a little bit because I think about like, well, the, I didn't get this thing right. I didn't get this thing right. Uh, uh, whenever I drive like uh, around Vancouver and I see people lining up liquor stores, I always think to myself, at least I got that right. You know, I, <laughs> I, I foretold that people would really want to drink when times are tough and. <laughs> And so uh, that, that's a relief, to be honest. Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, like pe- people sometimes ask me whether um, uh, they recommend that I, uh, I, you know, they read my book. And I was like, well, I don't know, really, you know, like, does it make you feel like, does it make you feel better? I don't know, you know, and uh, I'm glad that they do nonetheless, you know, and I'm glad that, you know, for some people just having someone imagine like a terrible event and like the worst that could happen uh, is, uh, you know, it, you know, is a relief and a release. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like you tell a story about something bad that happens and it has an end, you know, and we're living through something that doesn't have an end. So at the very mm-hmm. least you can offer a, a finale, you know, and I think mm-hmm. that's, that can be good. Yeah. And, and I find the book very hopeful, you know, from beginning to end. And, and I'll ask you specifically about that uh, a little later. But uh, 
Uh, can you just tell us how the story came about? Oh yeah, you know, like uh, I was talking on this other panel, and um, I, I was I was thinking to myself, we were we were actually talking about race, and it was like a, a panel of all Asian authors, and uh, and just like as, as the other speakers answered the question first, I, I it occurred to me that my book was in, inspired by a couple of acts of racism, like the mm-hmm. or or race, you know, and the first is like it came about. Uh, in the sort of days that followed uh, the 2016 uh, U.S. presidential election, in which you know it was this great assertion of uh, white privilege, you know, and, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, of, of uh, this desire to restore the the natural hierarchy in that country, you know, as as a lot of people saw it, and and so there was this sort of mood of despondency and this sense that you know that there's no escape. From mm-hmm. this despondence, even in Canada, which you know we're at some, you know we think we're at a remove from what's happening down there, and um, I was, uh, I was, you know, like around this time, my wife like was moving around the books, and that's what she does, just moves around the furniture. She, I think, she used to like move around a lot as a kid, and and so she's just moving the books around, and uh, uh, like the original copy of the plague was lying around, the one I read when I was eighteen, and. And I saw all the things I highlighted back then, and I just thought I just thought to myself, this is a good book that captures the mood of somebody who, uh, of what it feels like to be in the middle of something that is really terrible. And uh, and what I like about that book is it is in some ways very hopeful and about humanity, and also about you know what it means to be resilient and to do your work. Uh, and I wanted to explore those themes. Um, and uh, so I continued, I, you know, I, I tried to update it. And I, and one of the critiques of uh, Camus' work from a lot of uh, like Algerian and uh, uh, Arab writers is that Camus really didn't write about Algeria uh, as it was experienced by non-French people. Uh, and so I wanted to write a book in which there it featured a lot of uh, writers of people of color that is and mm-hmm. uh, and center those experiences not that like my experiences uh, and those experiences are all the marginalized voices in the city but I, I wanted to think about that and I want to explore what you know you know the plague that already was existing in the city which was the opioid crisis mm-hmm. in 2000. Uh, it's still, still occurring now, you know, where the opioid deaths outstrip like the COVID deaths by, you know, uh, uh, you know a severe margin, you know. And so uh, those are some of the things that were in my mind when I was uh, writing the uh, book. Mm. Yeah, it, it, especially the, the three central figures. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll get to them in a second, too. But just, um, you know, another question about creating the work. You know, currently we have tons of real life sort of epidemiological research happening around us with the COVID-19 response, right? Uh, yeah. but did you have to do a lot of that kind of research too as you were writing? I, you know, like I did uh, do some of that research and I and I talked to a couple of doctors, you know, uh, uh, and I read about SARS in uh, Toronto and in uh, Hong Kong and China. But ultimately, like, uh, I, you know, I kept the disease as the bubonic plague instead of trying to invent a new disease and give it like a newfangled name because I, I wanted it on some level to be like metaphorical, like not mm-hmm. something that is like meant to be like strictly seen as realistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's something you either go with or you don't, you know, and uh, so yeah, I, I did a little bit of it. I wish in retrospect, I did a little more, you know, like I was reading, um, I started reading a novel by Sigrid Nunez, uh, that was, uh, I think Salvation City that's set in the, uh, a flu after a flu pandemic. And this novel was published 10 years ago and people were elbow bumping. And I was like, Oh, I wish I was smart <laughs> enough to have elbow bumping. I think I had like something like a, like a hip, hip wave or something, but like <laughs> elbow bumping is so like you're really calling it if you're, you know, including yeah. that detail in 2010, you know? Like. <laughs> so 
You chose three central figures, as mentioned, to tell the story. Yeah. Uh, Megan So, uh, the author, uh, Raymond Sidhu, the journalist, and Dr. Bernard Ryu, uh, the physician, sort of, um, you know, at, at the center of it all, really. Uh, you hinted that, you know, it was important for you to have people of color uh, at the forefront of the story. But can you tell us a little bit more about why you chose these three distinct perspectives? Yeah, um, I think in the original book, like uh, like each of those characters has a bit of a counterpart, like in the original book. And as I started writing the story in it, uh, I I took like a, a synopsis of the original and mm. uh, I started just like changing the names and playing with it. It was it was a real like uh, interesting tool in terms of writing a book because I, I'm not terribly good at outlining uh events in a novel and and just by having like the sort of preset sort of plot that i was lifting um it, it it made me just it allowed me the freedom to think of other things i chose three central figures uh because uh i i, I guess that i wanted to write that kind of novel that sort of multi-voice novel and mm -hmm. write in the third person I'd, I'd, I'd only written first person novels up till then you know and and I thought there was a certain kind of freedom that could be experienced as a writer uh, to just jump between different storylines. Mm -hmm. I also have a kind of a disembodied third person narrator voice that I yeah. kind of lifted from a Camus novel. And it's, I think it's kind of like strange, you know, and it's very different from a lot of contemporary novels. And I, I liked it, but I kept, when I was writing it, I kept thinking like someone, an editor is going to say, you know, take this out, right? You know, and no one did. So I just went with it. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that that sort of overarching narrative voice. Uh, I haven't read the original Camus novel, um, mm -hmm. but but I found it uh, really added to the tension. You know, it sort of uh, drove towards uh, a sort of mysterious ending. And, and yeah. you know, when you find out what happens, I, I won't give it away, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I thought it made it a lot more more tense. Is do, do you feel that too? Like, was that part of your intention behind that? Yeah, well, it, it has that voice of like uh, the narrator of the... Uh, of like some sort of historical documentary yeah. or, you know, and, and so uh, it gives this sort of uh, gravitas to the story uh, that, you know, I try to riff off of like ironically. Um, yeah, and I think it does build towards tension because, uh, you know, everything is presented in the past, you know, as, a, as it being something that we, uh, we have experienced, but kind of have already started to forget. So mm. the tension is like, why have people started to forget, you know? And I, I'll be curious to know what happens, you know, uh, you know, when, you know, knock, knock wood, like there's like a vaccine and like what mm. happens five years from now, whether we're gonna just pretend it never happened. Uh, I feel like, like this is the theme of my novel and the novel I'm writing now is that, you know, like, we experience something bad and the first sort of inclination is just to try to like move past it, you know, and move beyond it. And if you don't deal with what you experienced in the past, you don't deal with the trauma and, and really think about it, it just sort of resurfaces in a, in a different mm -hmm. way, in a way that surprises you. And uh, it's really important to try to like think about and reflect mm -hmm. upon uh, what you experienced and how difficult it was. And, and speaking of personal traumas, uh, family really is a central theme to each of these three characters. Um, Megan So doesn't really disclose her past until much later, but she yeah. obviously uh, has dealt with some significant trauma over the course mm -hmm. of her life. Um, uh, Raymond Sidhu, you know, he's sort of going through it uh, at the time of the, the plague and really has these, you know, tensions and family dynamics to work through, you know, while reporting on this, this disease. And then Bernard Ryu, he also has some, you know, tragic uh, background in his family too. Uh, but at the same time, each of these characters is figuring out ways to sort of make things right with the people in their circles. So do you think a plague or a pandemic uh, helps bring these familial relationships into focus for people? Oh yeah, well, we're all experiencing that, that now when we're, you know, cooped in with our families. Or we're experiencing we don't have families too when we're living alone. Uh, for six months and we have limited contact with our friends and virtual contacts. Uh, so I think that really brings things uh, to relief. Uh, and 
Yeah, yeah I, I feel like with uh, Ryu's character, he's dealing with all these sort of uh, family tensions with uh, an ailing wife and mm -hmm. a mother visiting. And, and he's like a very emotionally, I think of him as a very emotionally distant person. Mm -hmm. And and he's he's grappling with this guilt about, you know, his relationship with his wife and her, and her illness, which seems terminal. And uh, and he pours it into his work. And, and then, yeah, Megan, Megan is somebody who really, thinks on an intellectual level about death but has like a kind of like this core tragedy that she doesn't talk about very often because it's too bizarre and outlandish and i think we uh sidhu is the person who has the fam the familial tensions most on the surface that mm -hmm. he has to deal with on his own and he eventually does deal with you know uh and so yeah i, I have it on three different sort of like mm -hmm. levels how, how that plays out it's like mm -hmm. that's very nice of you to and a studio of you to notice that thank you yeah well i really, really appreciated it and and as you mentioned you know right now obviously family is basically uh all i'm thinking about you know i um, had a, a baby born during the pandemic and you oh know a lot of his relatives yet yeah, because uh, you know we have to stay home and stay safe right um with the characters uh did you have a favorite is is there one that she felt you related with more do i have a favorite uh i uh i i like them i like them all like i, I in terms of like uh like periphery characters like 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 uh uh, like sort of minor characters. I really like the character of Grossman because I think she's oh, yeah. uh, she's just kind of kooky, you know, and I, and she's somebody I found kind of annoying. Like I I felt like I made her to be I tended her to be kind of annoying, but she just really grew on you, and and <laughs> and that's like that's why I like her, you know, like uh, and so yeah, you know, I don't, I can't say I have any favorites. Like I I definitely uh, I don't know do, do, like. I'm gonna ask you a question. Like, like, do you think do you have favorites in of your novels in your characters? That is. Um. Well, I think yeah. The the people that you know, I'm inspired by the people around me. Uh, you know, my family and and other loved ones, and and I think I pour all those good elements of those people into my protagonists and and yeah. really my my characters who I want to succeed and and do well. So I think I I relate with with them, and those are the characters I, I cheer for, right? Uh, it's funny you brought up Grossman, though, because, you know, when I, I first was introduced to her in the book, I was like, yeah, she seems annoying. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't expect her to sort of stay around, but she does. And she ends up being a pretty uh, key figure in the end. Right. So it's it, yeah. it was really cool how you did that with her. It was, it was pretty neat. Um, and and with that, too, I think um, she provides some hope. You know, she uh, endures, you know, tragedy as well. Um, and, and there is that underlying thread of hope throughout. You know, there's, there's the creation of the Sanitation League. Um, yeah. Was that really important for you to get across? Yeah, I, I want to, like, talk about how people, like, persist and make meaning in life. Like, even when it seems like there is no possible positive outcome you know and for me that means just treating people well as well as you can and sort of seeing a purpose in life outside of you know yourself and uh i think that is my takeaway from the original book and it's something i really uh placed into this book i also think that there's a real importance in doing what matters to you mm -hmm. you know whatever that is you know and and finding value in that speaking of that uh there are many chaotic moments throughout the story and i think in those moments the main characters align themselves with maybe some more nefarious elements like there's khan the smuggler right so yeah. do you think in a crisis like this basically anything's on the table for survival like you know allying ourselves with smugglers and people like that uh well i think in a, like a really desperate situation you find yourselves sort of doing things you never would do before right right mm -hmm. and uh and and then that can be surprising and and once you do something that once you cross a line where you're doing something that you would have thought of as being immoral uh like who are you you know mm -hmm. at that point um I, I thought of the Khan character as somebody who in some ways 
was freed by the situation. Like he, mm -hmm. he was living in his own sort of prison of guilt and he, uh, he was able, he was able to, you know, once everyone else was like him, he, he allowed him to, to act in a way that, that, uh, gave him an advantage, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was. I think a little bit about that. There's a character in uh, the Saramago novel, Blindness, who's like everyone becomes blind in that novel, but he was already blind, uh, and he has this advantage because he was already in this world. I think of Khan in that way too. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I, I think that yeah. Once you're put in a situation where, yeah, you're doing something you would have never considered before, uh, uh, you you you. you that does, you know, in situations like that, that you are placed in those positions, like uh, you do do it to survive and it, there's probably some justification for it, but then you have to really think to yourself, who am I now? You know, mm -hmm. if I've always believed that, you know, this is what somebody who, who's good and upright, this is what they do, uh, how does that change me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a really good question, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something I really thought about when I was reading Moon on the Crested Snow in terms of like, uh, I think the character's name Scott, you know, and mm -hmm. it was like, I thought that was really well done, I have to say. So. Oh, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, they say we don't really know ourselves until, you know, we're, we're placed in those moments of crisis, right? And, and you know, we experience that ultimate fear um, for survival. So, um, yeah, that, and that's what, uh, you know, I loved reading throughout uh, The Plague was just these responses to these new experiences, right? Um, and yeah. that's, by and large, what we're going through now as a society. Um, so do, do you think there are, you know, obviously some takeaways in your book you want to highlight, but are there takeaways from what we're going through now that you hope people, you know, learn? Or, or do you hope our current society emerges in, in a certain way once, if there's an end to all this? I hope there is like, I hope we learn from it. I hope, you know, through all this suffering and devastation that we end up with a fair, more equal, world you know i'm optimistic even though maybe i shouldn't be given human history but i feel like there's this real devastation that we need to we that we need to really process and think through i i think a lot of us i know i know i think about what's happened and i think i'm pretty lucky uh and I, I worry about other people who've lost jobs and I worry about my kids who've lost all these sort of great experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, stuff's happened to me as well. And I, and if I, I can't pretend that it didn't happen. So there's that emotional thing and that psychological thing and that individual thing. But then there's also, you know, bigger issues that we all have to tackle with in terms mm -hmm. of inequality, in terms of, our treatment of the marginalized people in our society. Uh, you know, I feel like, like like the George Floyd protests happening in the wake of COVID wasn't uh, a coincidence, you know? Mm -hmm. And ultimately I think there's also, you know, issues with our environment that we really, really need to uh, touch upon that uh, COVID, you know, is linked to, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of how we, how we like keep expanding into places that maybe we shouldn't be expanding to and there are consequences. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and there are issues of racism that we need to talk about too. So mm -hmm. yeah, there are a lot of things that this brings uh, the stirs up and hopefully in the stirring up, we can move towards some solutions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned racism was something that prompted uh, the creation of this book, too. And um, one thing I've noticed, uh, and this is just anecdotal uh, due to my circles and, you know, what I perceive on, on social media, my social media circles as well. Uh, it is a difficult time for, for many, many people, you know, yeah. right, right across the board. Um, I've, I've noticed, though, I think it's particularly difficult for people who've uh, enjoyed a lot more privileges um, throughout their lives. And yeah. I think people from the so-called margins and people of color who've, you know, endured racism and systemic issues and all that, you know, have responded in a different way. And I think maybe offer some important perspective to overcoming, you know, 
a world ending event. Um, is that something you, you see too, or, or maybe have, have thought of in, in recent months? Yeah, yeah. You know, like right before like everyone, everything locked down, like uh, I was still teaching at UBC in Vancouver and uh, I took my class to uh, uh, see an art exhibit by a name, a guy named David Bug. No, I can't say his last name. It's like a Polish surname or something, but he, he was an artist who lived in, the, in New York in the seventies and eighties and his, he uh, died of AIDS and his like partner died of AIDS and he really chronicled a lot of that experience. And I remember when I was writing the play, thinking about who has survived plagues. And I think about that, you know, community as one that has uh, survived the plague in our lifetimes. And, and I, I, yeah, I think that people from those communities bring like a, a, like a different perspective, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, and, and they've seen what it's like to be suffering uh, at that level and to see like the general population mostly indifferent to it, you know? And I think that in some ways can be very, very disheartening and, and scarring. Um, I think about some of like the, the trauma that like my, uh, my, my ancestors, my, my grandparents experienced uh, uh, during the cultural revolution in China, you know, not, it's not exactly a plague, but definitely a large scale societal sort of calamity. Mm -hmm. And, and how that sort of trickled down into my life, like there, there are sort of anxiousness that I just always thought was being over the top yeah. as a child, but having, you know, like a real cause, you know, and I think about how that sort of, you know, has affected my worldview and, and, like, like they grew up in this sort of real world of scarcity and, mm -hmm. and, and there's like this desire never to like waste a scrap of anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, so I see that even like in my life today in, in the way I sort of do certain things. And I think, I think there are many communities yet, yeah, as you were saying, who uh, have those sort of uh, traditions, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and uh, having World's End, you know, that that's a part of uh, many of our histories, right? And, and I wrote mm -hmm. about that in Moon of the Crested Snow, too. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing new to have um, basically everything taken away from you or, or be displaced yeah. and have to rebuild after that. So, yeah, it's important. I think, you know, I think we can all learn from each other through, through this time. So uh, I just want to remind people that uh, you can uh, ask questions in the YouTube comments and I will relay them to Kevin. Um, I just uh -huh. have a couple more before we get to those. Uh, I, I guess just just broadly, Kevin, what do you want people to take away from the plague, your book? Uh, I want them to think about, you know, I, I wasn't trying to like write a book in which I'm foretelling the future, you know? Uh, I. I Honestly, like people are saying, you're you're like a you're really prescient, you know. Like you, you know, like if I were that prescient, I'd be like, you know, like playing the lotto six forty nine or something. <laughs> I wouldn't be writing a novel. Um, so I want them to think about, you know, like what happens when, like what the plague stands for in the book, and what happens when uh, you you know, push away one problem. And I, and I think maybe I was being a little too like uh, subtle in the book because I think I think having seen some reaction of people outside of Vancouver, like like I presented like this world of Vancouver and I had this neighborhood in Vancouver that's really the downtown east side if everyone was sort of like eliminated, you know, like I imagined a world in which like everyone who had an, an opioid addiction had had died you know it was it was like a and and then we just like built over it we built some yuppie like a residential neighborhood and and everything was good and hunky dory at least we thought it was because we got rid of the problem uh, it disappeared and then it resurfaced in the plague you know and so uh, yeah i think that's the, that's the, that's the takeaway you know like what happens when you ignore a problem and it, it seemingly goes away and then it resurfaces mm -hmm. i i used to know in terms of like my own traumas like in my life I, I remember like uh like not properly grieving the death of my father and then like uh like like within like a, like six months i had all these ailments i had like these like uh 
I had, I had, uh, like, uh, I had like gout. I had like, mm-hmm. like high blood pressure. I, I, you know, I, you know, I had all these like, uh, uh, not lesions, but something else like, uh, sores on my body that, that just appeared. And it was just like my body telling me what my brain mm-hmm. wouldn't admit, you know? And mm-hmm. so I think, I think that's the biggest thing. And I think about, you know, how you create, meaning in a world that doesn't have meaning in a world that's unfair in a world that uh uh is cruel like what can you do to help you know like it might not necessarily be that you know you're the one leading the revolution but you can do small things to make the world a better place and you can support the bigger sort of trends that lead towards greater equality and and justice Mm, wonderful yeah, I think that's a key message, and and hopefully people remember that at the uh, at the end of this, at the end of uh, COVID nineteen. So uh, we do have a question uh, from the YouTube uh, comment scroll, um, and the question is: For teachers working with these texts with students at the high school level, do you have some suggestions about what's important to highlight, either in terms of the text itself or contextually? Okay. Well, I. It might be interesting, like if if you have the time to try to compare, like from my, in terms of my book, uh, the original with uh, my take on it, you know, and to think about, you know, like you did a module on plagues, you did a module on uh, epidemics in the past, you know, what do they reveal? Like, what are things that uh, we have in common? You know, like from the past you know and and how have people been treated in the past you know when i want to think of something like leprosy you had people who were you know shipped to islands you know and and allowed to sort of wither away you know mm-hmm. like with minimal in, intervention is there anything like that happening in the world today you know and and uh i th- i think it's interesting to, to have that kind of discussion on a more um, like historical level. Um, and you could also, I think, talk about, you know, what it means to have a plague in the age of, uh, you know, uh, video chatting and social media, like how we're connected to people uh, now in a way that we weren't even 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And in some ways that's something that's really a boon, but in some ways that's really still very difficult and it, and it comes at a cost. I think about uh, the original Camus novel in which people were separated from their loved ones and they could send like telegrams, but they couldn't really talk. And when I was trying to update the book, I realized that, well, we can see all the loved ones on our, you know, FaceTime and mm-hmm. Zoom screens. And so does that make things better? And I think in some ways it does, in some ways it doesn't, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it might be interesting to try to like, ask your students to try to like update a, like do their own update of, of mm-hmm. a plague story too you know i think or or you know like tell their own story mm-hmm. yeah i would just add about moon of the crested snow uh it's it's a different sort of world ending story compared to what we're going through now it's about a blackout but i think one of the major themes i tried to get across with it was uh understanding our relationship with the land around us and and knowing that you know the land has sustained civilizations everywhere um, since time immemorial, right? And I think recently, um, you know, we've of course become increasingly reliant on a lot of uh, modern luxuries like communi- communications technology and, and hydroelectricity and so on. Um, but the point of the book is really that, you know, when all of that is gone, you know, we still have the land here to sustain us. And I think we, we learned a bit of that, or hopefully we'll take that away from the pandemic. Uh, you know, there I wrote about to, a panic buying moment in Moon of the Crested Snow. And we saw that happening during the pandemic too, first with toilet paper for some odd reason, but you know, people started buying everything off the shelves. And and I think people, it opened especially privileged people's eyes to our relationship with the food that we consume, right? Most of us who live in cities are reliant upon food that is trucked in from elsewhere. And if that supply chain disintegrates, you know, how are people going to feed themselves? So, you know, I was pretty encouraged to see discussions around, you know, you know, small scale agriculture and community gardens and and so on come up as a result of that, right? So um, yeah, that that's what I I would like students to sort of try to examine or take away from another crest of snow anyway. 
Um, so we only have about five minutes left. Uh, you do have time to squeeze in one more question if you're watching. Um, one question I have for Kevin in the meantime is, uh, what are you working on next? Uh, you know, I, I actually wrote a manuscript like uh, during lockdown, you know, cool. and I'm worried that it sucks, you know, I haven't showed it to <laughs> anyone yet. Uh, and it's like one thing to be like writing a plague novel, like, you know, when you're just living your life uh, in a non-plague pandemic situation. Now that I'm, you know, now that we're all in a pandemic situation, uh, uh, I wasn't writing that kind of story, you know? And, I, and I, I think I had to like, in some ways tell a story where I sort of retreated to my childhood, you know, like mm. I was mainly writing the novel because, well, there was just everyone in the house, like, uh, in the springtime, like that's when like my wife's still at work and the kids are at school and I just have like time just to like stretch my legs. I'm, I'm done teaching for the, the summer. And, uh, I, you know, like that wasn't happening. So I had to create my own sort of interior space by like forcing myself to, uh, to write a, a novel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and so, yeah, it, it was set in the, it's set in the 1980s for the most part, and so, uh, it's set in a Chinatown. And but it's funny, like I think they're it like the 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 whole being cooped up. I have the characters sort of stuck in their house for like I think three weeks and unable to leave. And I think that is you know the pandemic sort of rearing its head like in in the context of this story, you know. And mm -hmm. it's interesting how you know our current circumstances you know really seep into our stories that are supposedly unrelated to uh what's happening in the world today mm, that's great what what um lastly well, what kind of art do you think will come out of this you know um do, do you think we'll see a departure from you know apocalyptic uh sort of works or you know disaster works or anything like that and maybe uh turn to more hopeful art any thoughts on that? I hope so. You know, I hope I I feel like, you know, like uh dystopian novels and pandemic novels, the right one right now, I think would just be it wouldn't be an escape and it wouldn't necessarily be like a a release. Mm -hmm. Like maybe nonfiction, I think it works, you know. Um but I am hoping that if not hopeful, then like novels that deal with people sort of processing yeah. like trauma and thinking about some sort of thing that's happened in their lives and getting through it. And, or I think that, you know, things that could be really hopeful and wonderful and, and uplifting would be great. Uh, I, I hope what, you know, like we don't sort of pretend it never happened, you know, mm -hmm. like I remember, I remember like uh, I was researching an essay about, you know, like what, you know, what we were reading in the aftermath of like September 11th, uh, which was such a big thing, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and I, like, you know, the number one bestseller was the Da Vinci Code, you know, and, and that's, it could have been any year really, but I was thinking to myself, like, it, it was like, a, the you know, people wanted to escape from it. They wanted to pretend it never happened. So we're gonna just mm -hmm. read something that was just silly, you know, and I don't want that to happen. I don't want people just to pretend this didn't happen. And I, I don't want things to, necessarily go back to normal because going back to normal means that a lot of the injustices that uh, and inequalities that exist before are sort of returned to, you know? And so it would be great to uh, have people like, and have writing that moves on from, from this in a good positive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so too. That, that's what I would very much like to see. Well, I think that will just about uh, wrap things up for us here. Uh, Kevin, big thanks for coming and chatting with yeah. us today. Uh, it was really cool to discuss your book. I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad to hear it's getting, you know, a bit of another wind uh, as a result of the pandemic. And I, I, I agree, it's it's a hopeful book, you know, despite uh, the chaos and uncertainty that you, you know, so precisely and expertly uh, laid out. I think a lot of people can take some good things away from it. So, uh, so Chimigwech, big thanks to you for coming and oh, yeah. uh, with us today. Well, it was a real pleasure. I'm a real fan of your work, and I'm looking forward to the Moon and the Crusted uh, Snow sequel. So keep okay. up the good work. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Hello again. Thank you guys so much for your conversation today. It was excellent.
right, uh, kicking you guys out. Okay, hello, it's me again. Um, next up, we have a five minute reading from Yusuf Saadi. Um, I will put on the screen. Hello. Hello, hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm well, um, I'm glad everything worked. For a second, I, I thought I couldn't enter the room, so I'm glad I'm here. Uh, we're also glad that you're here. Thank you. Um, I will introduce you now, and um, you will be able to do your five minute reading, and we have a break after, so don't feel rushed. Um, so Yusuf Sagi's first collection, uh, Fluvial File, uh, by Nightwood Editions, uh, out April 2020 this year, was selected by the CBC for its 2020 reading list. He previously won the Malahat Review's Far Horizons Award for Poetry and the Valium Chapbook Award, and has published poems in numerous Canadian literary journals. He currently resides in Montreal. Take it away. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to read um, several sonnets from my collection. Hopefully you'll enjoy at least one of them. Um, so the first one is called Love Sonnet for Light. I know a star in Andromeda broke every color in your heart that you shivered yourself to sleep in a meteor's crevice or moon's crater whose dust is now my skin. Beyond my finitude you dream a wave and particle at once. Know I love the way you warm my fingers, pour guilt on my hardwood floors, bear the universe's stories through bedroom windows. I wish I could touch you, not like two electrons repulsing, nor within the semiotics of language, but hold you how I hold a hand when I'm afraid and close my eyes when you're naked. The next poem I'll read is again uh, another sonnet. Um, this one's called Semana Santa. Perched on a hawker's wrist, the golden watches tick in chronologic bliss. A block away, a girl is late for mass turning stones to butterflies with a kneeling kiss. She trails a monarch to the church, watches from the door as her mother's crinkled fingers perch on Jesus' knee, parched lips praying so earnestly in devotion. She foresees the vision her mother will see once the children are tucked in bed. A flock of gold and silver watches flutter through the air, and fasten wristbands flat beyond her blistered palms. She'll wait, mouth thin as a minute hand, and utter psalms. The sun will pour like sand through her bedroom window. Juxtaposition to a slummy bar. A woman glugs a beer, wipes mouth, leans in and slurs. Tomas, todos somos putas. Um, this is, again, uh, another sonnet. I decided just to stick with sonnets for this reading. <clears throat> reading Borges on the moon. Its darkened faces lucent. Craters laddered and cliffs escalated. Electric boardwalk the sublunar ocean. A stroll in a light gravity. You remember in Renigo Disco in your poetry, but your moon is not my moon. The one Plato marveled at when he respited from his nyctophobia, a burnt corona that blinded Homer who couldn't spurn the beautiful, or the matter moon's omen in the sky after the battle of butter. Dream tigers prowled among poachers of starlight. In the future, I find a field of deserted moon rock and sit on a beach chair at dusk to read Borges, or to gaze at the earth, a moon to me now, scorched white from the old fires. Um, and of course, again, uh, another sonnet. If Van Gogh worshipped the moon. Desperate for paint, as the moon starved white ribs through your louvered window demand their sacrifice. You disregard its signs until night's corvine feathers begin to fall across your mind, or an autumn leaf, bister and wine red, a rare beauty. Alone with Theo's letters on nights so long, 
each word stranded between pure image and pure song. Moonlight walks, um, sorry, starlight drips across your pain. Moonlight walks on water and colors the only gods to ever be, the saffron sunrise on the sapphire sea. Um, and actually, since I have time, maybe I'll read one that isn't a sonnet. Uh, this is one that I like to read out loud. Hopefully, um, I'm not overstaying my welcome. The Taxi Driver's Therapy. Kolkata's klaxons corrode the wiring in your skull. A child, you watch the Brahmin sacrifice a goat at Kali Temple. Bare feet were islands on its blood. Your mother whispered, this is how we cleanse our hearts. But you can't recall what this means. Now you're hanging a bare foot from your taxi window, blistered toes and ten eye to scan the city for her voice. Instead of Ma's eye, you dream of two black crows sharing a cigarette on an awning. They light another, a light together for wherever crows go and outside of human experience. Your side mirror sniffs at woman's silken sari. The writing on the mirror states, summer is a time for reverie. In the alley, people are moving through each other, not ghosts, but so alive their skin's a porous border. I, I, is that my five minutes, Vanessa? Hello? Um, I believe that's my five minutes, so thank you all for reading. I'm sorry, thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the reading. Sorry, I'm a little bit frazzled. I am also, I'm so sorry. I don't know if I just popped in and out five times for you, but I did for me. Uh, I'm so sorry to okay. abandon you in that moment. Um, okay. um, but thank you so much for reading. That was excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, hello. Um, so that actually concludes part one of this stream today. We will be having programming continue for the rest of the day on this stream. Um, we have so much going on. Please check out the website, uh, Toronto dot, uh, the word on the street dot ca and the event directory will show you everything else that will be playing on this stream here. Um, thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, just me again to uh, make sure that everyone knows that uh, you can go to our bookshop at the digital mar marketplace at the word on the street dot shop. Uh, the Plague by Kevin Chong and Moon of the Crested Snow will be available uh, by uh, Baca Phoenix, Phoenix Books .com. Um, We will be continuing to have streams on this uh, stream, like I already mentioned, but we also have broadcasts happening that you can find on the YouTube for Books and Discovery, as well as Kids and Teens. Um, if you want to join our Discord channel, that is available on our website where you can chat with the authors some more, ask them any questions that you might have, uh, and otherwise just talk to other people who enjoy going to the festival. Um, the Word on the Street is funded in part by the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. We acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council, and Ontario Creates. Stay tuned for more programming.